uh, Eric Henderson comes to us from Dartmouth. Uh, he's the board chair. He's surgeon there. He's gonna. He'll tell us what he's gonna talk about. I won't kind of go through his resume and he can, he can speak for himself. What I'll say about Eric is I've known him for uh, right around 16 years now. I met him when I was just a month or two in the medical school. Uh, he was a resident at the time at the same program, and uh, he has consistently and steadily shown me generosity with his time and care about how I was progressing through my medical education. I, I have to say that's that's a rare thing because uh, we're all pressed for time, we're all pressed for our thoughts, and and he. 100% has always has always been supportive and uh, helping me along, and, and I owe I owe a good portion of, of whatever success I have achieved to to Eric's guidance and friendship, and so I'm very excited to have him out here and welcome him to uh, give us a few words for the next couple hours. So thanks, Eric. Okay, is this, is this working? Can you hear me in the back? Great. Okay, it, it is a complete honor to be here, and I think we started talking about this in 2019. <laughs> and then something happened in 2020 and kind of knocked um, all the plans back, and so it, it's, it's nice to finally be here. It also gave me an opportunity to, to do some more work that I can talk about today. Um, so uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, these are the, the grants which are most acutely responsible for the work I'll talk about today. And I, I do teach the, the annual uh, Stryker Orthopedic Oncology Fellows course. Um, I wanted to say something about John, because uh, again, I've, we've known each other for about 16 years now. John came to me, I, th I think his first month in the medical school, and said, I'm here, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, what can I do? And um, we, we did a lot together uh, during those years, and, and the, the paper that I'm probably most known for is this one. And uh, I think in the past you know, 10 years, it's been the most cited paper in orthopedic oncology. And um, I can tell you that John put in literally hundreds of hours into this paper. And this, this effort would not have come together without him. And the two of us uh, both put in probably close to 1,000 hours. It wouldn't surprise me um, to, to pull this off. And, um, I can tell you, you're incredibly lucky to have him. He is uh, one of the hardest workers I've ever met. Uh, he's very talented, and so um, I would gladly have him as a partner any time. I wish I had the clinical volume to support that. Um, but uh, anyway, he's, as I'm sure you know, he's, he's incredibly talented. Um, I just want to put in a word about uh, one of my bucket, uh, career bucket list items was, was seeing a North American registry for sarcoma. And it has come together much faster than I expected. Um, but I wanted to put in, regardless of your specialty, the, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeries uh, Family of Registries is a wonderful opportunity. And the, the MSTR has come together in ways that I would not have expected. So um, regardless of your specialty, I, I would encourage you to participate in, in, the, in the registries. OK. Um, back to this uh, topic. Um, I'll, before really diving in, I want to share with you, I think my, my 100 year view is that um, if a series of robots can, can assemble an entire vehicle in about 17 hours, with the addition of AI, and a few years ago I had this slide with um, the, uh, the IBM, but, but they've, um, they've been replaced by, uh, by ChatGPT, I think. Um, but uh, uh, why can't we get to the point where surgery is really autonomous and we can do a femoral nail in the, in the span of a few minutes? And this is actually now data. This is six years old. Um, but this was the first real example of a machine learning algorithm teaching itself something difficult and, and, and exceeding humans just in a matter of hours. And, and now we're at the point where the, the da Vinci robot has a single port. And so I really think that we're on our way to having autonomous robotic surgery. And if a lot of the things that we're talking about, like going to Mars, going to the moon, things like that, if we're going to do those things, we're going to have to pull something like this off because we're not going to take 
a whole cadre of surgeons into space just in case someone gets sick. Um, okay, so this talk um, begins here, and um, this was 2014. This is an actual slide from a, a presentation I gave. This is back when Nick was, was at Dartmouth. Uh, we miss you dearly. Um, but I, I arrived at Dartmouth with a, with a real feeling of uncertainty because um, I had published a lot in residency on limb salvage outcomes and failures, and I did not have that data with me. I was no longer with, in Doug Letson's backyard, and, and so I was, I was off on my own, and I was kind of looking for what I was going to do. So I was asked to give a presentation at our Center for Surgical Innovations research meeting, and I asked them, what do you want me to talk about? And, and they said, whatever you want. I had nothing of value to offer them, and so I decided to talk about what I saw as the future of sarcoma surgery. And so I put together this slide, and basically had this idea, I knew a little bit about fluorescence guide surgery, and said, well, if we could do these things, if we could envision these, you know, label these structures, then we could do, you know, ideally better surgery. And at the end of it, um, this gentleman, Brian Pogue, who is one of the most widely or wildly <laughs> successful uh, researchers I've ever worked with, he turned around and said these words. He said, I know how to do what you want to do. Let's talk. And with that, um, all of this work uh, was born. So the, the, the agenda for this morning, uh, we'll talk about um, you know, maybe why we need surgical guidance. Um, although after having dinner with Kevin Jones last night, he um, was kind of telling me that, that what we do is really not that difficult or, or technically challenging. And so it kind of threw the, the entire talk into jeopardy. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit about fluorescence. Um, and then we'll talk about what I've done in terms of advancing that for sarcoma, nerve, and infection imaging. Um, so if the goal is to make surgery safer and more effective, um, you know, how do we define that? And I, I think of when I'm going to the OR, I kind of have SEAL Team 6 in the back of my mind that I want to get in there and get out and have no casualties, accomplish the mission in as little bit of time uh, as it takes. But then I also like this um, you know, national park uh, uh, saying, you know, saying, take nothing but pictures and leave nothing but footprints and kill nothing but time. And so you, you don't want to leave, you, you want the patient ideally to not even know you were there. And the challenge is, of course, is that anatomy, um, maybe not for Kevin, but for me, is, is challenging. And there is danger everywhere. And you know, so what do we have right now as our, uh, as our tools? So we have our knowledge of anatomy, we have uh, our imaging, what we see, what we can feel, we can use a Doppler if we need to, and we have nerve stimulators, which don't work really well. Um, but that's kind of what, we, what we're left with. Now, in the setting of, of tumor surgery, so this is a patient of mine who had a, uh, a malignant solitary fibrous tumor. Everything is displaced. And so what, if, if you're a pilot, I've got a, a, a cousin who flies for Delta. He talks about flying by instruments and flying by sight. If you're going to fly by instruments in a case like this, you're probably going to get yourself into trouble. And for people who are not in medicine and they read an anatomy textbook, they say, well, you go in there and everything's color-coded. The nerves are yellow, the, the veins are blue, the arteries are red. But we all know that is not true. And this is a patient, this is a sarcoma patient of mine. You get in there and, and everything looks kind of the same, especially when it's been radiated. Now, CT navigation, and, and, and I'm not... I'm not diminishing its, its value, but it, it kind of came in as, as a potential antidote to some of this. Um, the problem is it's only effective with inelastic tissue and requires rigid positioning. Now, in the US, we have some problems with that. And so we have um, soft tissues that may not be amenable to, to CT guided navigation. So what we need is something which is more uh, penetrating dynamic. Um, I, a, a colleague of mine recently gave a talk, and he, he had all these uh, kind of transition slides of places he had been. I, I really liked it. So I, after residency, or sorry, after fellowship, I spent three months at the Rizzoli Institute in, in Bologna, Italy, which is kind of the, the birthplace of ortho-oncology. And this is their library. And it's just a beautiful spot. So if you're ever in Bologna, they will gladly give you a tour of the, of the library uh, at the Rizzoli. Uh, I spent hours and hours sitting at those chairs uh, working on, you know, papers and stuff. So... 
OK, let's talk a little bit about fluorescence. Uh, first identified back in the 1500s, uh, later better quantified in the 1800s. And then this gentleman, uh, handsome gentleman with the lamb chops, uh, first uh, really defined what, what's happening with fluorescence. And what it is is that a, um, an excited electron comes in, um, kicks up um, a, uh, or, or uh, excitation comes in, excites an electron up to a higher state, and then it, it comes down and emits a photon of a low energy. So this is what you get. Whoops, sorry. There's the laser. Okay, so this gap here, that's what we're talking about. And that is the Stokes shift. And so you excite a lower wavelength, which is a higher energy, and then you get back uh, a higher wavelength, um, lower energy photon. And this is a map of, of the, uh, the fluorophores that you see um, used in medicine. And what you really want to target is this area up here, because they're higher wavelengths, you get better tissue penetration, and they're brighter, so you can see them, which is important. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the, so you can, you can vary the, the tissue penetration you get uh, with a maximum of about one to two centimeters um, with, uh, with most fluorophores uh, by, by varying the, the, the type of fluorophore you use. And, and this can have different, um, different impacts. So if you're doing tumor surgery, if you want to see the tumor at depth, you want a longer wavelength uh, fluorophore. If you want to see the margin, though, you may not want to see the tumor at depth because that's going to give you an artificial read on whether you have a positive margin or not. So you really want to see the surface. So in the case of looking at margins, you may want to be down here, whereas if you want to see the tumor or see a nerve or, or some other important structure, and you want to see it coming uh, coming at you from a ways away, you may want to be at a longer wavelength. This is a, a quick history of the use of fluorescence in medicine. First described in 1926 uh, for, for work in ophthalmology. Uh, fluorescine was used for gliomas in 1948. And then uh, in 1999, this was a key paper. So this uh, gentleman, Harold Stumer from Germany, showed that uh, he could do a better surgical resection for glioma uh, when using 5-ALA. And um, as a kind of an overview of, of the types of fluorophores that we have, what are the mechanisms? So uh, you can apply it directly, topically, as, as in uh, ophthalmology. You can do intravascular probes. So that's what you see here uh, with angiography. This ICG, ICG is very safe. It's been FDA approved for about 70 years. It has a very, very wide dosing spectrum, very safe. Uh, enzyme activated, so this is a lumicell right here. Um, this is a breast cancer tumor. There's molecular targeted ones, and that's what we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about. And then there's EPR effect, which is um, tumors and areas of inflammation have leaky capillaries, and that allows fluorophores to drift into the soft tissues and be retained there. And so even the um, intravascular non-targeted fluorophores can actually be used to look at tumors. And so like John Lee at Penn has done a lot of work with that using ICG as a very nice uh, marker of glioma. Okay, and here are the FDA approved probes. So uh, fluorescein again, it's been around forever. ICG as well, methylene blue as well. 5-ALA is FDA approved for, for glioma, so glioblastoma surgery. And then OTL38, um, uh, was just recently approved for um, uh, ovarian and lung cancer. And here's the, here's the data from uh, Germany. This is, uh, or sorry, well, I said Harold, uh, Walter Stumer. Um, and this was the key outcome right here, is that six-month uh, disease-free survival was doubled when doing the surgery with 5-ALA. And so we have FDA, uh, this was first approved in, in Europe, and we have FDA approval now. And this is the mechanism. Basically, 5-ALA is, is converted to uh, protoporphyrin 9, which is a fluorescent molecule. Now, for me personally, this took on more personal significance. This is my dad's CT scan from last summer. And he was diagnosed with glioblastoma and had surgery at Moffitt using 5-ALA. And, and, and kind of watching this, and not that I needed more motivation, but this has kind of made this more personal for me. And then again, um, OTL38 has been approved um, and is, is folate receptor targeted. And actually, 
Um, the, the group at Purdue, which developed this, uh, is now looking to, to turn this into kind of a universal floor four cocktail. Um, transition slide. This is uh, Bedford Center. When I was had graduated college, I, I kind of didn't know what to do with myself and went on sort of a journeyman's kind of two to three year. I was a ski bum for a bit and, and did some different things. Uh, but this is a hospital, uh, an orthopedic hospital in South Africa. And I went and spent a couple months there. It was my first uh, introduction to the OR. Um, I saw a lot of patients in clinic and really kind of, you know, pushed me in, in the direction that I'm in now. So, okay, let's... Um, Let's talk about uh, direction or the, the applications of fluorescence that I have uh, pursued. So act one, uh, fluorescence for sarcoma. Um, you have to pick a clinical problem, right? You have to kind of know what you're driving at. So in the case of, of, of uh, soft tissue sarcoma, overall, the positive margin rate is about 17%, which leads to recurrence, it leads, uh, which recurrence leads to metastasis and diminishes survival. Um, the applications of fluorescence guidance that I've talked about so far all have to do with visualizing the tumor directly. And uh, so for sarcomas, where you want to do a wide local excision and have normal tissue around the tumor, that's not the applications that, that have been explored so far. So my goal was to try and kind of take the technology that was in existence and, and apply it um, for seeing the tumor through the tissue and improving margin, um, improving margins for sarcoma. So again, going back to this, if this is our goal, taking this and moving to this where we can see it with machines, I put together this list of, and in talking to Brian, put together this to-do list, and, and this is what I'm going to go over um, this work in the next few minutes. So, first of all, we need a fluorophore that's targeted for sarcoma. And at, at Dartmouth, uh, they had developed um, ABY029, which is targeted the epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, in targeted probes, there are antibody probes, and then there are uh, probes that use a fragment of the antibody, the binding region. And, and this has ramifications for the dosing. So um, here you see an antibody, and uh, ABY029 is based upon an alpha body, which is seven kilodaltons as opposed to 150. Now, why is that important? So um, antibody-based probes have to be administered two to four days before surgery to allow clearance and allow penetration to the tumor, whereas small molecule probes can be administered the day of surgery or just before surgery, and you have uh, reasonable contrast by about two to four hours. These nanobody probes, uh, this, is, this, is, this was new to me, uh, very interesting. So llamas and alpacas, uh, produced nanobodies, which are basically antibody surrogates. They actually have antibodies as well. And it's not really known why these animals have, have produced these, but these are very small, very highly specific molecules that can be directed at tumors. So there are some nanobody-based probes that are in, are in development right now. Um, so why did we choose an EGFR target probe? Well, sarcomas overexpress EGFR at a high rate. And overall, it's about 60%. So it's a, it's a pretty good starting point. And you can see here, from the lab, this is uh, the leiomyosarcoma line that we use. And you can see, just this is after eight hours, that the, the contrast we're getting with the tumor compared to fascia, nerve, fat, and muscle. And, and we have, in, in preparation for this, we, we did look at ICG, uh, so indocine in green, and we did try to take advantage of that, uh, the EPR effect that, we, that I talked about. And what you see is with ABY029, compared to viable tumor with EGFR overexpression, you see a very linear uh, level of uptake, whereas with uh, uh, ICG, you see the opposite. So it tends to congregate in areas of tumor necrosis. And, and so you can see, we, uh, when we put them together, it was actually synergistic uh, because the, the ICG congregates in areas of, of, of uh, dead tumor necrosis, and the ABY congregates in areas of viable tumor. And so it, Overall, it helps improve whole tumor binding. Now, um, if you're going to do something like this, animal models don't really you know, help because if you've seen a, a mouse tumor uh, or a human tumor you know, transplanted to a mouse, there's really no guessing where it is. So we need to come up with, in my mind, with a, 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 um, an ex vivo manner of simulating human tumors. 
So we'll take a, a, just a little side, tangential side journey here. Um, 13 million Americans per year get trained in CPR. And, and that's a lot, right? Um, now, how did this happen? Because CPR has been around for, for centuries. It, it was first described by the Egyptians and really kind of came into its own in the 1800s. Um, but it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s that training really exploded. And why was that? Well, it's because someone created the uh, resuscitation mannequin, Annie. Um, and, and you can go on, this, this video is actually available on YouTube, and this is when CPR really took off. And so the, the point is, is that having a way to simulate anatomical, biological um, uh, phenomena is very important. And, and so the reason to develop this, this phantom was you know, reduced human harms, uh, decreasing animal use, which actually reduces costs too, it's, it's very helpful. You want reliability and reproducibility. You want to be able to do these things iteratively and experiment with them. Um, you want to uh, have, um, you know, again, better, human sim better simulation than what you'd see in an animal model and reduce cost and time. And, and as I mentioned, you know, so with this, with this um, xenograft right here, there's no guessing where that is. There's no mystery about it. So trying to do a blinded surgery is not going to work. And so the goals for the, the phantom were to have visual properties similar to human tissues, easy and cheap to make, uh, and, and have them opaque so you can't cheat to see the tumor. Now, I started looking into this, and it just turned out that Brian Pogue, who I mentioned earlier, wrote the paper on this. And so he had actually come up with ways to, to simulate human tissues uh, for, for optical testing. And, and so we, we took his recipe effectively, and then we, using known biological optical properties of tissues, we made these wells and, and we experimented with these mixtures until we got it right. So we found the, the correct dosing for, for fat and for muscle. And with that, we created this thing that looks like flan, uh, looks like a dessert. And it's you know, roughly this size. We, we, we molded these in, a, in an Nalgene uh, lab uh, vessel. And, and I have dissected hundreds of these. This, is, this has been our vehicle for, for moving testing forward. And you can do all kinds of things with this. Once you have the, the tissues sorted, uh, we looked at various imagers and how well um, they can penetrate uh, the, the, the different tissues, and what you can expect in terms of depth imaging. This led to these nice curves here. So we see uh, uh, depth here, and we can see the, the fluorescent signal. And so this gave us ways to test the imagers. This, is, this was a, a really nice vehicle. And so we were able to create you know, various phantoms. They look like hot dogs, I know. Um, and then this was able, we were able to you know, come up with these nice plots about how, you know, what, what volume of fluorophore is going to lead to what increases in, in uh, penetration and signal. And then this was part of my K award, as we then started to dope these with gadolinium and with Omnipake, and so we could scan them and actually uh, see the tumor. And then, and then this is uh, Medtronic Stealth Station. This is this is a uh, this is a Perkin-Elmer Solaris. That's the fluorescence device. But this is Medtronic, you know, cutting edge uh, navigation. So we're able to combine CT guided and MRI guided navigation. And, and then you can see trays of these things, right? I mean, we could, produce, we could produce dozens of these in a day, and they're good for a few days, and then we can, we can run them through the scanner, and then you can dissect them. Now, again, the dissection is not like surgery, just to be very clear. Uh, we're going for optical property uh, representation and not for, for you know, tissue simulation. And what we found is, and again, we could, we could these were blinded, uh, these were little tumor inclusions within the, the phantoms. When we dissected with, with fluorescence alone, we could get negative margins. And you can see, and this is, uh, this is expected, that the, the distribution of, of uh, margins, so this, here the goal was a, was a one centimeter margin. And you can see the distribution got wider as we went to a lower tumor to background ratio. Um, but the takeaway here was that even with a two to one tumor to background ratio, that was sufficient contrast to, to dissect tumors out with, with clean margins. And this is, what you, this is actually what you see. Um, so this is, the, this is the tumor dissected. This is under fluorescence. And, um, and so we could make you know, very detailed measurements of the margins and correlate that back to the fluorescence. 
And in doing so, then we were able to map these out and, and then create kind of, you know, perform some predictive studies where we would dissect to a certain depth and then um, predict what fluorescence we would, we would see and then see if that was actually correct. And you can see here it wasn't quite right. Um, and then we actually did a, a flying by, um, by instruments dissection where we, uh, we just dissected down to the fluorescence value that we expected for a given margin. And um, what we found is that with the fat phantoms, uh, the adipose simulating phantoms, that we had narrower margins than predicted, so we took away more tissue than we should have uh, for a one centimeter margin. For muscle, we had wider margins, and so we, we left a little bit um, too much. Uh, but all in all, it, was a, it seemed like a reasonable way to go about uh, your imaging, or, or about dissection. It, it seemed like a reasonable, uh, at least, indication that we were on the right track. Now, going back to the translational pathway for ABY029, at the same time, animal testing, preclinical work was, was, was ongoing to prepare for first in human work. And here you can see in our various uh, sarcoma lines, this was the, the pharmacokinetics of ABY029 over time. And when we compared ABY029 to IRDI700, which is a non-targeted fluorophore that was just injected in the bloodstream, you can see that, as you would predict, it, it peaks and goes down. But ABY obtained better contrast, usually from about four hours on. So same-day dosing was, seemed like a reasonable, um, uh, uh, you know, reasonable timing for, for ABY029. Here, you can see some of the same data, but uh, traced out over the different tissues. And so you can see that the contrast you get with, with IRDI 700 is somewhere around two and a half to one, uh, whereas with uh, ABY 029, it was more like three and a half to one. And remember that number, because we'll, we'll come back to that once we see the human data. Uh, so we did get to humans. Uh, and then one other question that we had, and this is part of my K award, was that are the, the, the neoadjuvant treatments that we're doing for these patients, um, are they affecting the, the, the expression of EGFR? Or are they express, uh, changing uh, the amount of fluorescence we would see? And just kind of jumping to the end, the answer is no. We didn't see a reduction in EGFR. We actually saw an increase uh, with Ewing sarcoma, and we don't have an explanation for that. We also looked at the various images that are allowed, or the images that are available commercially. And, and the Perkin Elmer Solaris, as you already saw, I gave it away, um, did win out in terms of uh, best features. And so that's the one that we went ahead with the, for the study. Perkin Elmer was so enamored with, with our choosing uh, their, their uh, imager as the best that they stopped producing it. So it's actually not in production anymore. Um, and then this is the human work. So, we uh, set up a, this was not a true, a, a true phase zero study, it's a microdose, and, and FDA has defined that, and I won't get into that. Um, but we did a kind of a phase zero slash one where we were able to go up to a 6x times microdose. And we, the, the patients received the floor for the day of surgery. They went, they had their surgery just, just like normal. There was no fluorescence guidance in the OR. But then the tumor was, was taken and processed in pathology and then imaged. And then we uh, identified the three highest areas of fluorescence, the three lowest areas of fluorescence, and took uh, biopsies from those, from those sites. This is all the data I'm not going to show you. This is the take home message from the human study, was that as we went up in dose, we did see an increase in fluorescence. Um, and as in the, the uh, uh, Fluorescence did appear to, to correlate well, positively, with the expression of EGFR. And at the end of the day, uh, 3.25 was our whole tumor, tumor to background. And, and this is true with, with a lot of small molecule probes. The, uh, um, the contrast was higher at the tumor rim, which is actually what you want, right? And, and that was uh, 4.25. And so a reminder that the, the TBR that we saw in the animal day was 3.5, which is pretty close to what we saw here, indicating that our, our animal models are probably reasonable surrogates to what you see in humans. As an afterthought, one of my patients who went to the OR as part of the study, he happened, he had, a, he had a known met in the chest, and so one of our chest surgeons was taken in the OR. So we ended up imaging that. It was the same day. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. If it had been a couple, a couple weeks later, it probably wouldn't have worked. But we imaged the, the metastasis, and you can see how well that fluoresced, uh, indicating that, that um, 
thoracic uh, imaging would, you know, for metastasis would probably be a very viable application for this. Act two, we're going we're gonna to step away from tumor and talk about nerve imaging. Um, I don't have to explain to anyone in the room, I think, how important nerves are and, and why avoiding injury to them is important. So kind of skip over that. I want to be very clear. All the chemistry, all the probe development we're about to talk about comes from the Gibbs lab at, Ohio, or at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, I had nothing to do with that. So um, Summer Gibbs is a professor at OHSU. She's been very successful. She was Brian Pogue's PhD student. He introduced us, said that he thought we would be good, a good pairing uh, for, for advancing this work. Um, but that work belongs with her and her team. So just want to be very clear about that. Um, Summer took a, a strong interest in nerve imaging uh, at the end of her PhD and began looking into uh, oxazine, which is a, a molecule uh, which uh, is, is a known fluorophore and also binds to, uh, to nerves. And so as you can see here, um, so this is a control, no, no fluorescence. You can see how well these various iterations of oxazine highlight nerve tissue in animals. And, and you can see here, this is using the da Vinci robot. Um, and uh, you can see with white light, you can't see the nerve. Uh, but with uh, under fluorescence, you can. And, and you can see about the wavelength. Most of her probes are somewhere between 600 and 800 uh, nanometers. Uh, they do have a 1,000 nanometer probe now that we're kind of tinkering with. Um, we'll see where that goes. So, in, in her lab, Summer had a PhD student named, named Lei Wang. He is a chemist by training. And he is now taking, the, the, the library is now up to 300 probes. They, they have 300 iterations of oxazine now. You're looking for an investment opportunity. Uh, trace biosciences may be, may be a good one. So, um, and I, as, as PI on the clinical study, I am not allowed to be an investigator, so just to be very clear. Um, but they have, they have created this whole library of probes with various, uh, you know, various uh, peaks in terms of emission excitation and, and what appear to be various uses in terms of nerve imaging. Um, so the, the, one of the questions that I was trying to help them answer was, they've got so many probes, which one do they advance to, to clinical trials? Because that is a very important, I think, I think you all realize this, that is a very important decision that can cost them a lot of time and money. And their academics, we're, we're working on an R01 uh, budget to do this. And so, um, so we, we can't really make a mistake. So one of the things I, I had to offer was human tissue. And so we got a, a IRB approval and started doing staining topically of, of her probe. And you can see, you know, this is, this is reasonable. It shows some good contrast. We're, we're rinsing them with saline. But it's not really clinically relevant in terms of what, uh, what we're you know, looking for. So I had this idea, <coughs> I think I was laying in bed, and I, I had noticed that we had a decommissioned uh, cardiac perfusion pump uh, in, in CSI. And you may see where I'm going with this. And so I had this idea, well, what if we took amputated limbs from the OR, rushed them down to CSI, and then hooked them up to this perfusion pump, and then administered the fluorophore? And that handsome guy, uh, Logan Bateman, who's about to graduate with his master's degree. Uh, I'm his uh, primary uh, uh, mentor for his, his graduate studies. And then he's starting uh, at Dartmouth Medical School in the fall. Um, he took this and ran with it. So this was, we've actually updated the system now, but I, I bought a cart and, and a grate. And I made this out of PVC. And we wrapped it in, in, in uh, saran wrap. And, and that's the, that's the uh, cardiac perfusion pump right there. 20 years ago, that would have been state of the art in cardiac surgery. And, and we took limbs, cannulated the dominant artery, and here's, here's what we saw. So this was actually much better imaging than what we saw with, with the topical application. So you can actually see individual fascicles of the, this is a human sciatic nerve, um, uh, individual fascicles of nerve compared to adipose and muscle. And, and here you can see a, a wide field. That was on a scanner. This is, this is actually uh, more in vivo. And here you can see a, when, you, when you section the nerve longitudinally, you can actually see the fascicles of nerve in there. Um, where are we right now? So we have a date of May 17th to apply to FDA for, the, for our IND. 
Um, we've had two meetings with FDA. They've both gone very well. Um, I can tell you that meeting with FDA is a very surreal experience. The things they care about are not the things that NIH cares about or that we, you know, it, it's, it's just a very interesting um, discussion. This is the kind of a crude representation of the model that we're looking for. Uh, we're going to administer to three patients. Uh, if we, and we're going to, originally we were going to just go until we had useful contrasts and no, no toxicity, but we're going to try and go up to the, uh, to the limit dose based upon uh, the preclinical data. Now, what about nerve injury? So one of the things that we started talking to um, uh, Summer's lab about was, you know, what do we do? So if you've injured a nerve in, in the OR, you think you've injured a nerve in the OR, you know, could the floor four potentially be useful? And so Anas is a PhD student in Summer's lab, and he designed this series of experiments. And so we've been doing uh, complete transection, so neurotmesis, and then crush injury. And you can see here that after, right after a crush injury, um, uh, you can see uh, this um, you know, progression of loss of fluorescence signal. And, and you can see how the, the, the crushed nerve versus the viable nerve, you start to see a change in, in the relative contrast. This is a white light overlay with the fluorescence. Um, this is what you see with, with complete transection of the nerve, neurotmesis, uh, over time. And, and, and ironically, or actually maybe not ironically, but uh, we see increased fluorescence in the, in the distal part of the nerve and, and loss of fluorescence in the proximal part. And then, um, and, and then the, the entire nerve loses fluorescence over, over time. Um, and we just, uh, actually let me, let me go to the next slide. This is with a mild crush injury. And you can see over time that the fluorescence starts to return as, as nerve function starts to return, the fluorescence starts to return. And with a, with a more severe crush injury, uh, you see the same thing, but, but more delayed. And, oh, let me, so Anas just showed at lab meeting, uh, we have a Zoom. One of the nice things about, uh, about COVID, uh, if there is anything, is that you know, Zoom meetings, um, despite how painful they can be, have, have brought people together. And so we have a weekly you know, nerve imaging lab meeting, and we're able to bring everyone together. And it, it, it's great. So Anas just presented his 17-week data this past week. And actually, the, the animals are now re regained full function of their nerves and have essentially full, full fluorescence. And so the, the real question, though, is, is seeing fluorescence return with nerve injury that's great, but it's actually not that helpful. You know, what, what, you, what you really want to do is if you think you've had a nerve injury, what can you see at the time of potential injury? Or a trauma patient comes in the trauma bay, you know, their nerve, their, their sciatic is out. You know, what could you see intraoperatively that would tell you that patient, that, that nerve is going to come back? And so that's, that's been my charge with the NOS, is how do we get to the point where we can make uh, accurate uh, prognostications about what's going to happen to the nerve? Okay, around the time I started working with Summer, <clears throat> a couple years later, one of my colleagues, uh, who Nick knows, um, had, a, had a child who was diagnosed with Hirschsprung disease. Now, I, I didn't remember anything more than I remembered from med school, but I was, I was you know, intrigued by it and started reading into it and, and realized that um, there might be an application for the fluorophore. And so we started just very recently imaging colon specimens to see if we could see the ganglia that failed to migrate in the setting of Hirschsprung disease. And it appears that we can. And so I'm actually PI on a colon imaging project at Dartmouth, you know, um, and, and Sam Streeter, who's a brilliant young scientist working with me, has designed and, and, and uh, written an R21 to explore this. Um, all right, Act 3, necrotizing infections. And this, I will tell you, this is the area that I am most excited about, partially because this is kind of my baby. Uh, this was the one work that we're going to talk about that really kind of you know, came entirely from me. But it's taken on a whole life of its own now. As you can see, we've got collaborators across the, the country. And in our R01 scored very well recently. Um, as soon as I'm done with you guys today, uh, or you're done with me, I will be working on revisions which are due on Tuesday for this. Um, but I'm very excited about this. Um, as you all know, uh, so, so for those who may not know, so flesh-eating bacteria, which makes it in the news every once in a while, is necrotizing um, fasciitis, more recently renamed as necrotizing soft tissue infections. Has a mortality rate of about 30%, which is quite high. And 
Standard of care is generally emergent broad spectrum antibiotics and surgical debridement, which is often amputation for, for cases in the limb. Now, it's very doable. The problem is, is that it's hard to tell these patients from a bad cellulitis. And so these two patients present to your ED. One has cellulitis, one has um, neck fash, and may die within the next 24 hours, and which one is which? So there's three major clinical problems with neck fash. And this was born out of my own frustration, by the way. Like, I, I've been in the OR a few times with these cases and really not known what to do. And so the clinical presentation is nonspecific. Here is an overview for the R01. We reviewed every article published on neck fash in terms of trying to diagnose it. And you can see overall the results are quite poor. There's no definitive test. So, and there's also no means, no accurate means of guiding surgery. So the conundrum is, is that, you know, if you, if you have a patient with, who has, does not have an STI, receive non-aggressive management, they're probably going to, they're going to live. Um, but if they have aggressive management and they incur unnecessary morbidity, they're going to sue you. And if a patient has an STI and they receive non-aggressive management, they're going to die and their family's going to sue you. And, and if they receive aggressive management, then they may live. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a terrifying place to be in as a provider. And I've been in it myself. And this is the, the impetus for this project. Um, so we need to improve diagnostic testing. We also need to improve surgical guidance. And we want to achieve what I would call the Goldilocks ratio, which is having just the right amount of resection to, to cure the surgery. So where do we start? I, I started looking into this after a couple cases at, at Dartmouth and um, looking at the histological features of necrotizing soft tissue infections. And I came to this, and this was around the time I started working with Brian Pogue, um, that there is a profound superficial thrombosis that occurs um, uh, with necrotizing fasciitis. And it turns out this has been well-defined uh, biochemically. And Amy Bryant, who's the lead author on this, or this 2003 paper, um, she is now a co eye of mine. I reached out to her recently and, and told her about this work, and she said, I'm all, on, all in. So she's actually a co eye now. It's been great. So I read about this and this activation of the clotting cascade, and I thought, well, why can't we apply ICG angiography to necrotizing soft tissue infections and potentially uh, diagnose them better? And so the hypothesis was is that this thrombosis that you see would yield. Would yield um, flow voids with ICG that would uh, be diagnostic. So this is our study design. You can find this on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, we started with, with 0.5 mg per kg of ICG. It was too much. It was, it was a white out. Um, so here's an example. So patient A and patient B present with identical labs. They're both neck fash rule outs at the Dartmouth ED. And
is, is video that leads to this, okay? And this patient ends up having cellulitis. You see a whiteout. There's actually hyperemia there, so you actually get more signal than you would normally see. And this is a, this is a calibration phantom. Um, and, and this is what you see in the, in the neck fash patients. You see you, these flow voids, which is what we had hypothesized. And when you drill down, so Jonathan Elliott uh, is one of the scientists uh, in orthopedics, and he is maybe the world expert in ICG kinetic modeling. So then he takes a look at this and, and does these really fancy things with it. And, but right here, this is where the rubber meets the road. So in unaffected tissues around here, this is the, the, I, the ICG kinetic peak you see. This is what you see in the, in the, in the, in the tissues affected by neck fash. And, and you can see these you know, kind of pretty uh, models. And this is, this is, these are the, the features that he's looking at right here. And then this is the data. So we've, we've enrolled now 14 uh, patients. And, and just with 14, you can already see that the sensitivity and specificity of, of the ICG imaging uh, far exceeds the Lorenic score and, and has, has achieved significance already. And, and so this is the... Um, uh, you know, where, we're, where we're going next, uh, we do have ORIF funding for this. Thank you very much to them. Um, we, it looks like we're, we will likely have an R01 for this in the next few months. And, um, and we're going to uh, undertake prospective multicenter uh, testing of this. Because there's different bugs regionally, and we, we, we don't know that we're going to see the same features um, at, at all sites. And, and this is mainly group A strep because that's the, the predominant bug. If this appeals to you guys, it's too late to write you into the grant, but, but would happy, you know, happily include you. Um, all right, last transition slide. This, uh, I, I almost died getting up to take this picture. This is Tabo in India, and they, they told me it was the least populated uh, area in the, in the uh, world outside of Antarctica. And uh, I went there on a, on a medical trip right after medical school. Okay, so what's next? So we'll, just a couple minutes left. Um, we are now working, one phenomenon of, of, of uh, fluorescence that, that caught my ear one day, in lab, uh, or one day in lab meeting was that you can stimulate most fluorophores at an off, away from their excitation peak. Um, you don't get as much energy back, but you can do it. And so we're looking at multi-excitation, um, multi-wavelength excitation strategies, which will tell us what tissue depth is. Because if you, if you reconcile what you're getting back at two different frequencies and you know the tissue type, you can, you can extrapolate from that what the uh, depth of the, of the structure is. Um, we're also looking at ways to, at how, so if we're going to assess margins in the OR, do we scan the surgical wound or do we scan the specimen? Because there's advantages and disadvantages to both strategies. And we're also adding in the nerve agent. This is a combined, so this is a, a two-channel, uh, two-fluorophore strategy, but this is a soft tissue sarcoma in a rodent, and this is the sciatic nerve. And, and so we, we think we can get to the point where we're administering multiple fluorophores and seeing multiple structures. Um, we're also trying to see if we can develop a, a multi-fluorophore uh, cocktail, if you will, uh, for, for sarcomas. And you can see that uh, each, uh, each fluorophore has different uh, capacities to bind tumors. Now, the FDA does not like this strategy, to be very clear. They don't want humans getting multiple uh, drugs at the same time that are not real well vetted. So how well that's going to play out, I'm not sure. Um, another uh, researcher at Dartmouth has shown that in low oxygen uh, situations, that fluorescence, um, you get much uh, higher uh, fluorescence back from tumors as opposed to normal tissues. And so we think that this might be a, a compelling um, a strategy to explore. Uh, and then finally, Sam Streeter, who I mentioned before, uh, he's been, uh, this is part of his PhD thesis work, is using uh, what we call structured light or spatial frequency domain imaging um, to, to further reconcile the accuracy of fluorescence guided surgery. And it, I, I frankly don't even really understand. They've explained to me multiple times, um, but it's a way of using special cameras to get better data. And finally, with, with the necrotizing soft tissue infections, you know, my goal is I, I really think that this work to, to, to use ICG as a diagnostic test is going to pan out. The data is very, very good. Um, and, and something I'll talk about in the second hour is I never analyze my own data. I, in fact, I don't even touch my own data, you know, especially with all the stuff we've seen in the press recently about academic fraud and that. And, 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 I, and I think some of these people are well-meaning, um, but one of my... Um, 
you know, hard red lines is I do not, um, I don't even know where some of my own data is stored. Um, uh, you know, the graduate students and the scientists put it in there, they analyze it, we try to give it to, uh, to statisticians who don't have any skin in the game. And so I really recommend that going forward. Um, but uh, so, and then we're, we're hoping to convert the ICG work into, you know, where do you make your incision and where do you cut to do a curative resection for, for, for neck fash? And um, uh, because that's going to be a much more, I think that's going to be a much more difficult problem to tackle. You know, where, where the, what's the leading edge of the bacteria? And that's part of the OREF um, uh, funding. I'd like to say thank you to all my collaborators um, all over the country. And again, I'm, 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 we just added Stanford and UPMC, uh, 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 so Pitt, um, to the, to the NECFASH study. Uh, but I, I'm always welcome to have uh, more friends and collaborators. Um, this is our Sarcoma Strong team. Uh, two years ago, we had a, a pancake breakfast at my house afterwards. And um, so anyway, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, oh, Kevin, Kevin. Oh, Kevin, Kevin always asked a question. So, Eric, it, it's, it's, you know, an incredible amount of work, all this stuff you, you presented, and, and, it, and it's, it's really, you know, a broad reaching sort of set of ideas. The challenge I have always had with the sort of this final imaging for sarcoma is, is what problem are we solving? You know, not, 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 not can we do it or, or can we sort of, you know, shoehorn up and use for it, but you are a sarcoma surgeon. How often are you cutting close enough to things where you're not using anatomic planes that you can already tell anyway? So I, I, I'm just, you know, ever since David Kirsch, you know, sort of had had his his intravital imaging stuff in, in mouse models, you know, back when we were probably at school still or something like that. I, 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 I thought this was interesting. It's always like, when would I actually do this? Like, what is there a case? I can see it working for that, right? So there's something where you're actually taking it out and you want to see what's left. But for an actual soft tissue sarcoma, which is what most of these have been focused on, I just think, I never want to see the tumor in, in my dissection. Mm -hmm. and, and so how, how do you see it fitting in to an actual practice? So I agree with you. I mean, that's part of the challenge is that you don't want to see the tumor. And so I think that the, in terms of the multi-excitation strategy, I, I think that there's, there's room for, <clears throat> during the dissection, having a... Um, you know, both a, a short and long wavelength strategy. Um, but, you know, like with epithelial sarcomas that are known for having, you know, these little satellite metastases, mixofibrous sarcoma, which is known for having microscopic extension. I mean, it's my hope that, I mean, those tumors are, are responsible, as I think, you know, for, for a lot of the local recurrences out there. So for your low, lower grade liposarcoma that's in the lateral thigh, right. Like that's, that's like doing a, a robotic total knee. Actually, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's, you know, my, our orthoplasty surgeons, you know, they're very, they're very skeptical of, of the robot for a routine total knee. So I think that there are, there are, I think you're right. For a lot of tumors, there is not a need for that. But... Um, clearly, with, with the overall you know, positive margin rate that's in the literature still, um, you know, I think that there, there's obviously a need, at least at some centers, and, and, and maybe you and John are so good that, that you know, we don't, you know, there's no room for improvement here. But um, I think that, that clearly the literature supports that we need to do better. And then the, this is somewhat of a nihilistic argument for people who are actually human surgeons, but I think that we're going to get to the point, if, 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 if robots are going to be doing surgery for us, which I really think, I think that 100 years from now, we won't be driving. In fact, I hope that happens sooner, because my, my seven-year-old son is not headed to being a, a, a responsible driver. And so I really hope we get to autonomous vehicles before then, uh, before he turns 16. But 